So let me just give you the story of what happened. So Ty, Ty has not been feeling very well since about Christmas. She's had the, the, I think they call it the group, croup, croup, I don't know what it's called. Anyways, it's all that, you know, real snotty, whatever. And, uh, and we've noticed that she was getting really thirsty. I mean, just drinking water like crazy, eating a lot. And uh, so Lindsay started doing some, some Googling stuff and, uh, you know, Google doctor and, and said, well, we think, you know, she might have, have diabetes. And, and, you know, I was like, no. You know, in, 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 in me, I was like, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. You know, I told Lindsay she's hitting a growth spurt, okay? She's hitting a growth spurt. But we noticed that, that Ty was, was losing weight and she was getting dark circles under her eyes and just – Y'all know Ty. Ty is independent. She's hard-headed. She, she, she's tough as nails. She's just like her daddy, and that's trouble for everybody, but she was not herself. So Lindsay took her. She had a, had a checkup, took her to the doctor, told the doctor. Doctor uh, uh, took blood, uh, checked her urine, and sent us straight to Children's Hospital. He said, y'all get over there. Sugar was over 400, I believe. Uh, it topped out around over 500. And, uh, and, and we've been at the hospital since. The, the, all the tests that was ran, everything uh, came back as type 1 diabetes. So um, as of right now, we have a type 1 diabetes 4-year-old little girl as of right now. Now, I'm not done praying. I'm not done, I'm not done claiming her healing. Her healing will come when God's ready for it. Um, and, and I'm still going to claim that healing every single day. Um, so... Uh, I'm, when I say I'm coming to you raw, now I'll probably have more sessions here in a minute where I'm just going to bust out crying, just see, see through it because God's got a message for somebody here today. And I want him to use my testimony, Ty's testimony, and my family's testimony to reach somebody today. All right? So I, I want to talk about that quote that, 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 I, that I talked about, about I, that my passion overrides my excuses. So many times in, in our lives uh, today, especially in today's world, we are, we are full of excuses. Well, I can't do this because. I, ca I, can't, I, can't, I can't love my wife enough because. I can't treat my children uh, uh, like, I can't discipline my children like they should because I love them too much. I won't be their friend. We just have so many. If, if y'all have never heard Pastor Joey's sermon, it's all about the butts or big butts or whatever it was called. That is a sermon that you need to go back and check out because we, we are so full of our own excuses. We're letting our passion for God and God's kingdom die away. All right, let me read you the definition for passion. Again, I'm coming to you straight from raw definition, okay? It says, uh, strong and barely controllable emotion. A state or outburst of strong emotion. An intense desire or enthusiasm for something. All right, that is what the word passion means. So let me ask you a question. If, if money was not an option, okay, if money was no option, what is one thing that you would spend your life doing? What would you do? Would you fill it with things of the world that brings you joy? All right, heck, I'll, I'll be one of those. I mean, I would, I would go, if money was not an option, I would go by the state of Texas, okay? And that, that would be where I would be living for the rest of my life, would be in the state of Texas, and have as many cows as I could put on it, all right? That's what I would do, all right? Because that's my passion. But if, if money was not an option, where, where, do, where is your desires lay at? Is it, is, is it with worldly things? Or is it with God? See, we get so caught up with, our, with, the, with how we live every day on this earth that sometimes we forget about and go after the things that God really wants us to go after. Listen, I've been in a place, you know, it seems like the past few months where I'm just, I, it's like I, I try to read the Bible and, and, you know, I got the, the thing on my phone. I try to read, but I'm just not getting nothing out of it. And the reason why I'm not getting nothing out of it is because I'm not putting nothing into it. You know, it's one thing to read your Bible. That, that's all fine, great, and dandy. 
But it's one thing to put time and effort into studying your Bible so that God can speak to you through His words, through His verses, through the stories that, that's in the Bible so that, so that you can learn something from that and apply it to your life. Because we don't read our Bible with passion. We read our Bible out of whatever. Repet- read it every day, repetitive reading. We, you know, we, read our, we don't read it with passion. I'm challenging myself now to read my Bible with passion. Instead of trying to read 10 verses at a time, let's break it down to maybe a verse to half a verse and really dig down deep into the meat of what that verse is really trying to say. Because even though one verse may apply something in my life, Somebody else could read that same verse and God's going to turn that thing around. It's going to mean something completely different. That's what's so great about this word right here is that every question that we have, there's an answer in here. And then it can apply to every situation, every person, no matter your background, where you came from, this word right here can apply to your life. You just have to read it with passion. Dig into it, an uncontrollable emotion. Get into your word and study it. You want to know how to make your marriage better? Read it with passion. Find out what God really says about marriage. You want to look into it about finances? Read it with passion about finances. Don't just get in there and go in the back of the book like I normally do. Listen, I'm coming as raw as I can to you. I look up the word finance to see what the Bible verses say about it. That's not what God wants. He wants us to read his book with passion. Find out exactly what he says about it. And then apply it to your life. That's what passion is. You know, I, all we have to do is, is look at the state of our United States today and see where our passion really lies at. Was it last week or week before when New York passed that terrible uh, new law? Okay? And see, what that has done is it's opened the door now for other states to follow suit. We've got Virginia. I think was on the next docket. Um, uh, was it New Hampshire? One of those other, other New Jersey, one of those other states up there are doing the same thing that New York did. They're trying to pass the same law which says that a baby can be aborted right up until delivery. Where's the passion for our church at? Where is the church? Where is the church? Can I read you some statistics real quick? Again, I'm going raw with you. In 2000, or I'm sorry, in 1990, all right, in 1990, 85% of U.S. citizens, 85%, that's a pretty good percentage, 85% of U.S. citizens claimed to be Christians. That's a pretty good number considering the amount of people that we have living in the United States. Now, granted, that's in 1990, okay? Let's fast forward to 2001, 11 years later. 81.6% of U.S. citizens, I'm I'm not talking about overseas, I'm talking about the great United States of America. 81.6% of U.S. citizens claimed to be Christians. Let's fast forward to 2012. That number dropped down to 78% of U.S. citizens claimed to be Christians. 2015, that number has dropped down, this is just four years ago, has dropped down to 75% of U.S. citizens claim to be Christians. That's approximately 173 million people in the United States right now, claim to be, and I'm using that word claim very loosely, claim to be Christians. Of that 75%, 62% say they belong to a church. Okay? 62%, uh, not, I'm a math nerd, okay? If y'all get confused at me, just raise your hand. I'll try to explain it. But 62% of the 75 say they belong to a church. Listen to this next number. This is, this is where, where it really goes away. In 2013, 
the Pew Research Center reported that 37% of all Americans attended church on a weekly basis. 37%. So now hearing those statistics and seeing the, 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 how our country is, where is the church? They at home. They're at home. You don't know why our country's in the shape that it's in. It's because there's no passion coming from the churches. There's no passion coming from the Christians. There's no passion that, that's building up and, say, and saying this is wrong. Yes, we've got some out there that are doing the right things and trying to get legislation passed to where that, that once conception happens, that that's when life starts. Yes, we're out there trying to get that done. But it's a little bit too little too late. Where's the passion of the church at? Better yet, where, where, where is my passion at? Where is your passion at? I'm, I'm going to get on personal level with you today. I'm not an emotional guy at all, I promise you. You can ask my wife that. I don't cry at all. Okay? If me get up here in front of you and start crying and say something today, you can ask my sister. All right? I don't cry. I make her cry. I don't cry. <laughs> right, Randy? Okay. So where's your, God has really been dealing with about passion here lately. So how is the church supposed to act? What is the job of the church? How are we supposed to be passionate as a church member? How are we supposed to be passionate as Christians? Well, I'm, we're going to go to, uh, to Colossians chapter 3. Starting in verse 1. Now, I'm, I'm coming out of the message Bible because I love the I'm one of those type of people that you've got to tell it to me straight. That's the only way I can understand it. And that's how I coach football. I get trolled by parents all the time. I know this is going to be on the Internet. I don't care. But sometimes there's, there's some tough love that needs to be given to our kids. All right? And, and I don't care whose kid it is. If they deserve some tough love, by Lord have mercy, they're going to get some tough love. I, that's why I love the Message Bible, because I was like that. I was coached like that when I was playing sports. Man, my coaches would, if I did something wrong, I knew it. And then I knew not to do that same thing over again, okay? Um, I know I forget. I'll, I'll tell this story. My mom told me. I, I, was, I was in, um, I guess, 10th grade or 11th grade. Anyways, I was... I was uh, uh, playing football, and I was playing cornerback, and, uh, and I had broken my finger the week before practice, and I was all taped up. I still wanted to play. So I get out there in, in the game, and I was playing. Well, I get burnt for a touchdown. Okay, guy caught a touchdown. It was like a 60-yarder. You know, and I was my first start. Well, my, my coach pulled me off the field, and he grabbed me by the face mask, and boy, did I get it. I mean, I got it up one side and down the other. And, uh, and quite frankly, I, I cried and did a few other things after that, too, because it scared me to death that somebody would talk to me like that. But the coach went to my mom after the game, and he said, Mama, don't be mad at me. Don't be mad at me, because what I did to your son tonight, he will never make that mistake again. And I did not. <laughs> never. Actually, I went on and, uh, and, and uh, got all state honorable mentions for some – for, for cornerback, and that just set me up to be successful. He had a passion that he saw inside of me where he knew that I could be successful if I was just pushed a little bit and, 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 and urged a little bit and give me some tough love where I could be successful, and I was. And I respect that man to this day for doing that. If he hadn't, I could have turned out something different. You know. But anyway, so that's why I like the Message Bible uh, so much because it is it is point blank, it's to the point, and I understand it. Okay, so we're gonna come at you out of the Message Bible today. So first, uh, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter three, starting in verse one. It says, "So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it." So once we become Christians, once we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, there's a passion that is, put in, that is put inside of us for us to be passionate after the things that God is passionate about. 
And it says, living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorb with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from His perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even through invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too. The real you. The glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. And that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual, uh, prom- listen, I'm not an English person. I'm going to skip this word, okay? All right? I'm, I'm, I've got my southern draw, and I, I apologize for that. But impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like it, which is a huge problem in today's society. People want things right now. They'll do whatever they got to do to get it. They don't want to go through the, 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 the right steps to get what, what maybe they feel like they deserve. They want things right now. Well, sometimes God don't do things right now. I'm going through that right now. I want healing for my daughter right now. Well, God said, no, son, it ain't happening right now. It'll happen on my time. And that is something that's so hard for me to, to grab a hold of and to comprehend because all I see is my little girl over there suffering, okay, And it breaks my heart. But you see, there's a testimony that will come out of that. And that testimony is going to be able to reach some people. I know it is. And grabbing whatever attracts your fancy, that's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of God. Let me pause right here. If you've missed Pastor Joey's series that he started the first of the year, guys, that is a life changer I, I'm one of those that that you know yeah I'll, I'll probably deal with things in the in the feeling emotional realm a little bit but I just that the what Pastor Joey preached boy he talking about a bullseye on me that was for me and I know it was for a lot of other folks in here as well but that's a life that is shaped by things and feelings instead of by God don't take this wrong, but sometimes God doesn't care about your feeling. <laughs> don't take that wrong. God cares about how you feel, but sometimes he don't care how you feel. And he's going to let you know that. There's a country song that's, that I think it's a country song in it. It says sometimes the, the, the best prayers are those that are unanswered. And that's a tough one to deal with. Because it's, it's not what I want here on this earth. It's what God the Father wants on this earth. And that's what's so hard at being a, as being a parent, is knowing that your child is, is having to, to get her finger pricked at every time she eats, taking a shot every, after time she eats, and having to take two shots at night. I mean, it's, y- y'all talking about tough. Guys, that's tough. And you don't understand it unless you've been through it. You don't understand it. When your little girl looks in your eyes and says, Daddy, another shot. That's t- But God will be glorified. Next verse, please. <clears throat> It's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and not knowing any better. Before you became a Christian, yeah, you were probably doing some stuff that you didn't didn't realize was wrong. But once you, you became a Christian, now you know that that previous life that you were living was wrong. That's not of God, right? Next verse, please. But you know better now, so make sure it's all gone for good. The bad temper, God's having to deal with me on that too. The bad temper, the irritability, meanness, my sister, profanity, (laughs) 
the, the dirty talk. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. I think God is pretty much saying what you've done beforehand is not who you are today. You have a new identity whenever you become a Christian and, and, and God has put His Spirit into you. If you miss that series, you better go back and get it. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the Creator. Uh, with, with His label on it, all the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized, un, un cult, whatever, slave and free, mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by who? Christ. By Christ. You are not defined by your previous life. The one thing that the devil is great at doing is bringing up your past and say, this is who you really are. You remember whenever you did this so long ago. You remember whenever, you're not, I'm not worthy to be on this stage today. If y'all was to see my past, y'all would take me off this stage right now. I'm not worthy to be up here. And I'll even get, get on a more personal level. There's not many in this audience that would be worthy to be up here either. But when God gets you, when He gets you, He will strip you down to nothing. And He will build you up in His image. But that's one thing that we have so hard. That's one thing that, that we... That, that, that's hard to live in the life in the world that we live in today is to be that Christian that God's called us to be because we're all about our feelings and what other people are going to think about us. Where's your passion at? From now on, everything is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, Humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment, and never be without it. Let me tell you something about love. In this word right here, I believe there's a verse in there that says love covers a multitude of sins. And a multitude of them I have. But God says, whenever you, you put on the image of me, let me clothe you. I will strip you down, take all those sins away from you. It doesn't matter what you did in your past. You cannot let your past dictate what your future is. No matter what your past looks like, God says, yes, there's forgiveness for that. But there's also a future in me that I will give you. That's what my Bible tells me. Can I read you another definition for passion? I just read you half of it. Can I read you the second half of it? The word passion derives from the Latin root word patty, P-A-T-I. Okay? Patty. Which means to suffer. Totally opposite. Of what I read you all ago. The word passion derives from the Latin. If you don't believe me, go home and you study it yourself. Everything I say, you take it home. If you don't believe me, you look it up yourself. It comes from the Latin root word patty, P A T I, which means to suffer. Let me tell you something. Can I get real with you? Think about that day on Calvary. 
what our Jesus had to go through. That's what passion looks like. You know exactly what was going through his mind as he was taking that journey up to Calvary. Every single one of us in this room. He had so much passion for us that he was willing to take that journey to Calvary. So that our sins could be forgiven and that we would have an everlasting life. Folks, that's passion. That's passion. That's passion with a purpose. Somebody needs to write that down. That is passion with a purpose. This one thing that you can be passionate about anything in this world that you want to be passionate about, but you have a passion with a purpose. What's the end result of your passion? Passion does us no good if there's no, there's no reason to have that passion. It was passion with a purpose. That day on Calvary, all of our sins were dealt with that day. All of our sins. And I'm not going to get on no soapbox or anything, but I, 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 I love, I'm going to be hypocritical for just for a second. I love Facebook for some reasons, but other reasons you find out who really somebody is. Well, ago I used the term um, claim to be Christians. Facebook could tell you who's one, who's not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It'll tell you. Now, the Bible tells us we judge those by the fruit of their spirits, all right? And a lot of that stuff they put on there, I mean, you can, you can judge it for yourself. We are supposed to be different than the world. As a Christian, as a born-again believer, we are supposed to be different than the world is. If you claim to be a Christian, but you're doing worldly sins, guys, you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself. We're not supposed to be of this world. We're supposed to have a passion with a purpose. And that is to reach those that are not have not been reached yet, but reach those to be reached again. Those that have fallen away. Sometimes those are the hardest people to get to. Those that, ha that maybe have become a Christian, something happened, they've fallen away from God. Sometimes those are the ones that are the hardest to get back to that second time. But when you have passion with a purpose and you show them what we read a while ago, the number one thing that we're supposed to put on every single day is what? Love. When you show the love of Jesus and you can show them that that love covers a multitude of sins, you've planted that seed in that person. Ultimately, the decision is going to be up to them. But you did exactly what you were supposed to. You've planted that seed. That's passion with a purpose. Passion is what moves you to persevere at something despite fear, unhappiness, or pain. It is the de determination and motivation to push through suffering from the sake of an end goal. Suffering. What does that mean? What, what does suffering mean? My Bible tells me that this life is not going to be all rainbows and biscuits and gravy. It tells me it's going to be a tough one. It tells me I better put on my armor of God every single day. The devil's coming at me every single day. But you've got to get in the mindset in you. That's what we've been taught, that the devil's going to come after us every single day. Let's flip that around just a second. Let's flip that around just a second and say, hey, devil, we're coming after you today. 
Hey, we're coming after you today, devil. You, you may, you may have, have, have caused chaos and all this stuff in our life. But listen, it's going to be for the glory of God, not the defeat of the devil. Sometimes God allows stuff to happen in our lives for reasons. Okay? He does. He allows stuff to happen in our lives for reasons. What those reasons are, sometimes we'll never find out. But there's always a purpose behind everything that happens to us. Will my little tie have type 1 diabetes the rest of her life? I don't know. I don't. I pray that she is healed today in the name of Jesus of it. But I don't know. But am I going to allow that to stop me from doing my calling on this earth because I'm mad at God? No. I'm not. Because what happens, Ty's testimony, I believe with, with a shadow of a doubt, Ty's testimony is going to be able to reach some people that nobody else can reach. People that you can't reach, people that I can't reach, but she'll be able to, if it's just one person that is saved by my little girl having type 1 diabetes, it's worth it. Just one person. It's worth it. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, Meanwhile, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Let nothing in your conduct hang on whether I come or not. Your conduct must be the same whether I show up to see things for myself or hear of it from a distance. I think God is telling us something right there. Quit being fake. Can I just be straight honest with you? Quit being fake. Quit being something on Facebook whenever you're really not that type of person. If you've got issues, you need to get those things fixed. Quit being fake because God's looking from a distance. He, you know, as a kid growing up, you do stuff that you, you don't want your parents to know about, right? You know, you're going to beat up your little sister or something. Tell them, don't tell mom or daddy because you're going to get in trouble, right? Right? Well, that's what this verse is, is telling me personally. It's saying, you better act like I'm standing right beside you 24-7. Because that is what a Christian is supposed to do. Whenever you're in the quiet of the quiet, whenever you're, whenever you're by yourself, what you do in private reflects your life. And I believe that's how God is going to judge some of us. What did you do in your quiet time? What did you do whenever you was away from everybody else? Not the personality that you put on in front of your church people. What did you do in private? How much time did you spend? I'm spitting all over the front row and I'm sorry. How much time did you put in, in with me? That's what he's going to be looking at. And I'll be the very first one to tell you my quiet time hasn't been the best. I'm preaching to myself this morning. And hopefully one more person. Your conduct must be the same whether I show up to see things for myself or hear it from a distance. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. Not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. That is what the church is doing right now. Because we're all about feelings right now. We're worried about what somebody's going to say or think about us. We're too worried about hurting somebody else's feelings. God is not a God of feelings. He's a God of love and compassion. But He's also a God of tough love as well. Your courage and unity will show them that what they're up against. Defeat them Victory for you and both because of God. God's saying, listen, if you would just go meet them and show them that you as a church are united, they will be defeated. They're going to see that and they're going to turn around and run because nothing can stand against the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's far more to this life than trusting in Christ. There's also suffering for Him. And in the suffering is as much a gift as the trusting. Man, when I read this right here, guys, 
that there's more in the suffering of Jesus than the trusting in him. I was like, God, what do you, and I'm, I haven't, I haven't studied this out like I needed to to bring it to you today, but I'm going to. Because there's something about the suffering for Jesus. There's a reward, I believe. I'm about to read it to you. There's a reward that if you suffer for Jesus, now we're not talking about going out and nailing yourself to the cross. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being a Christian in today's world. If you are a true Christian in today's world, you are going to suffer. That Bible right there tells me I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be called out. I'll probably be cussed out. I'll be spit on. My life, everybody's going to look at me with a microscope, and as soon as I do something wrong, they're going to come out and cry about it and say, ha, ha, you're not saved. But thank God I put on the love and the understanding every day that I have compassion for those people because it, I don't care what they think about me. All I care about is what he thinks about me. Amen. I'm not a perfect person. I will never be a perfect person. You're not perfect, and you'll never be perfect, but that's no excuse of why you can't live a godly life. You're involved in the same kind of struggle you saw me go through, on which you are now getting an updated report in this letter, and I'm not going to go on into that. So, man, if y'all want to, y'all go ahead and come on up. The problem with church and Christians is that we are not willing to suffer. Because to be passionate about something with a purpose is tough. It's hard. you got to have it on the inside of you. You've got to have it on the inside of you. Are you willing to go through those trials and those tribulations? Are you willing to stand up against the adversary and say, listen, devil, this, this, you came this far, but that's as far as you're going. I did not want to get up here this morning. But I asked Ty, I said, Ty, you won't go to church. She said, yes, Daddy. I don't want to go to church. There's a promise that God gives us. If we suffer through this life, there's a promise. Can I read you what that promise is? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians, please. All this trouble, all this stuff that we've been through, the trials, the tribulations, the ups, the downs, all this stuff that we've been through going through this life. clear sign that God the almighty God has decided to make you fit for the kingdom you're suffering now because the promise says justice is on its way. When the Master Jesus appears out of heaven in a blaze of fire with his strong angels, he'll even up the score by settling counts with those who gave you such a bad time. His coming will be the break we've been waiting for. Those who refuse to know God and refuse to obey the message will pay for what they've done. External exile from the presence of the Master and His splendid power is their sentence. But on that very same day, on that same day 
when he comes, he will be exalted by his followers and celebrated by all who believe. And all because you believed what he told you. What has He told us? If you believe. If you believe. If you believe. If you would please stay with me today. I, I, please, out of respect, of every, I would love for everybody to just to bow your heads and close your eyes. Because I, I, I feel like in my spirit right now that God is dealing with some people right now. And, 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 and I, I, I don't mean to, to get y'all emotional and all that kind of stuff. I'm just coming to you as, as raw as I am. But I truly believe that there's somebody here today that needs a touch from heaven. I believe that there's somebody that could be in here today that, that, that needs to get saved. That, that, that needs, to, needs to, to, to bow down before the King of Kings and Lord Lord and say, God, I've came this far. I'm sorry for what I've done in my past. But today I'm making my decision, God, to pick up your cross and to follow after you. If that means suffering through hell to get there, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. And God, I pray for that one person, Lord. That one person that you're talking to, Lord. And and Lord, I, I just pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that you just give them a peace about them right now. God, that they know they need a touch from heaven. And God, that you're going to be that one that's going to touch them. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want you to slip up your hand. If there's somebody here today that needs to be saved, that you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. Oh, we're not going to take too much time. If that's you, just lift your hand up real quick. Just real quick. Anybody in here that needs to get saved? God's tugging at your heart. Your heart's probably beating really fast right now. You know that you know that you need to have, you need to be saved. That's anybody, just lift your hand up real quick and put it right back down. For the next group of people, and I'm I'm, I'm going to be talking to myself because I'm in this group. The next group of people, God has been dealing with me on my passion, where my passion lays, what my passion needs me. I want a passion with a purpose. And maybe some of you, you're, you're probably in the same situation where, where, where maybe, yeah, you've been going through the motions. You've been doing this and doing that. You've been living a pretty good life, but you know that there's more that you want to tap into. There may be some suffering that you're scared of. But Jesus is right there saying, listen, I'll go with you. I'll never let you go on by yourself. Just an acknowledgement to God, is there anybody in here that says, I want to carry my passion a little bit further? If that's you, just raise your hand. Guys, there's hands up all over this congregation. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I come to you right now. And God, I pray for this for this message, Lord, that you've preached today, God. God, I pray for every person that lifted their hand today, Lord, that you would just... Be with them, God. Show them the areas, God, that you want them to have more passion for, God. God, I pray for a passion for purpose, God. A passion for a destiny. A passion, God, that, God, we're going to have to suffer to get to. But, God, you give us a promise that on that day of judgment, God, you will come down and you will rescue us. And you will set us at the right hand of you. God, take our passion deeper today take our passion further today. 